I personally think everybody should learn Python. That's my own opinion, but I think Python is a great enabler. I don't think you have to become an expert in it, but it opens up so many possibilities today in what you can do. Well, guys, here's our 50-pound less Chris Hamoon joining us on the podcast. Yes, that is the same last name. In other words, he's my bro. Uh, he, he's been absolutely crushing it with his business, Data Parrot, and uh, you know what he's doing there with AI and what he's doing there. You know, for the for the business community is unbelievable, unstoppable. And Chris, welcome to the podcast, man. Yeah, hey, thanks for having me. I think I met you before. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But I am, I am older, let's be honest. Let's uh, be super clear. So I'm the elder brother here. So whatever I say goes. Well, if you're um, older, I'm better looking. I mean, we all have our advantages, right? Very, very, very debatable. We'll put that to a poll. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't, know, I don't know if you want to know the answer on that one. Although you are looking a lot thinner. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually be honest. Like I was making jokes with uh, a friend of mine today. I'm like, you know, Chris thinks he's a big deal. And, uh, and then I joked and I just said, no, he's just big. And, uh, and then now I'm looking at, I can't make those jokes anymore. Yeah. I've lost, uh, almost 50 pounds this year and gained 20 pounds of muscle. So super, super here I am at my standing desk, got my weights beside me, hit the gym all the time. And, uh, you know, when you really have, I think it's combined with when you're building a company and trying to build great things, it all just fits together. Like it just creates that incentive, that discipline, that motivation to get going. You know, I think most of the people out there that are hitting at the top levels, like I do a lot of work with Grant Cardone. And dude's absolutely jacked. And, you know, you look at any of the top, you know, CEOs out there. I mean, they're all really just getting themselves in great shape. And I think it's it's definitely a movement that we're seeing. Yeah, totally. So what I like to say is uh, perhaps even as early as this summer, my wife is going to have to defend me at the beach, you know, to, to fight off the swarms of women, you know, and I'm walking around with my six pack that I hope to have by then. <laughs> If not, then hopefully your bank account will make up the difference. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Working on that. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. So uh, AI is one of the big things that we're seeing as a movement. And I know you're, you're probably in that space where you hear it almost drone out that everybody is like, you know, I made a toilet and it's got some AI in it. You know, I mean, everybody just using it. It's almost feels overused, mm -hmm. but it's underused, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So it de really depends where you are. So I'm in the tech startup world. So of course, AI is a lot more prevalent there. But even then, with the, the rapid pace of AI and the rapid pace of development, it's changing so dramatically that people who think their knowledge of three months ago is relevant, it's no longer relevant. So it's not just actually learning about AI, what it can actually do for you, but it's staying on top of this stuff, in my, in my view, perhaps daily, but, but at least weekly because of how much it can change your business, your go-to-market, drive your revenue, et cetera. I remember I was at a collision uh, conference event in Toronto. Uh, I don't know when it was, just beginning of this year or whatever. And I was talking with this lady and she was just in line. We were getting ice cream. It was fantastic. And, uh, and, I, and she was just coming back to work. She worked for a large, some large software company and she did copywriting. And, uh, and then I said, oh, man, what has AI done? What has, you know, ChatGPT done to your your job? He goes, oh, she goes, oh, I know. I get back next week and I got to kind of look into that, I guess. And it that'll be a problem because <laughs> yeah. this is the lowest hanging fruit. What most When most people think about AI, they think about it in terms of generative AI, which yeah. is, you know, creating copy, automating blogging, automating sales copy, you know, basic blogs. Like there's actually a really cool tool called Byword that does that. Um, and I think that's all super interesting. I think that's very much early innings on AI. And I don't even think that's how we should be thinking about AI. I think there's much, much bigger transformation coming from AI, even in the next six months, next three years, five years. Well, let's talk a little bit about that, because one of the things that spawned this conversation, obviously not just the fact that you and I talk frequently about it, but when I was watching you on that um launch series with that Callag Callahan fellow. Jason Calacanis, yeah. There we go. And uh, and one of the things he said is he said, you know, when a lot of these startups, you know, he's looking at, they they would start with 10 people. You know, now they're starting with six people, maybe even four, because of the, the just the massive savings they're getting through cool. using AI, not just for generative stuff, but for other aspects within their business sort of lean in on that. What does that kind of, what do you kind of understand that to mean? Well, a few things. Definitely one is um, you can build and get a startup 
off the ground, out the door, no matter what it is. It doesn't have to be a venture scale startup software company. It could be a restaurant. It could be a services, based business, whatever else. If you really look closely into the tools available now and even using, not just using the LLMs directly like ChatGPT or Quote or whatever, but some of the tools on top of it, you can massively accelerate what you can get done. So for instance, um, a lot of companies say, I need to hire a marketing person and a salesperson and a success person. I would say if you're under 10 people, you only need one instead of those three and they can do all three of those things. And I would further argue, I'd really hope that person learns Python. Because if you can learn just a little bit of tools like that, which, by the way, AI, AI can really help you do that, can connect the tissue, automatically create workflows and automations that help you service your customers better, help you accelerate faster, and ultimately get you more revenue. You know, the idea that I think the the sales rep or the marketing person doesn't integrate with technology, um, I definitely think they're going to get lost behind. And, and I know for myself, you know, for my businesses, the idea of understanding Python as an example, um, you know, ChatGPT will do a certain portion of it and then YouTube will clean up the rest. Mm -hmm. And and to be able to get out, to be able to just do some very fundamental things uh, within Python or, or within JavaScript or whatever else you need to work in, you can really hit both of those as, as the methods. I mean, most of the stuff I've done with any of the AI stuff, I ask ChatGPT, what do I do? And then it gives me the direction. And then now sometimes it's wrong and sometimes it's very wrong. Like I've had it giving me some, it really tried to convince me how to do a mortgage uh, calculation that was totally off the rails wrong. Yeah. It's not great at math right now. And that there's a lot of conversations around that. Yeah. And, but it's, it's very convincing though, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it, and I think it actually said to me, it said, Oh, you got me. And, uh, and <laughs> I'm like, I didn't get you. You just were wrong. And uh, so, yeah, it, you know, those kind of things are interesting. But the idea that a person who doesn't know anything can go to that no code kind of approach um, using code, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, I kind of think about it like in our in our generation, without going back to, you know, previous major leaps in technology in, in my adult, not adult life, but in my lifetime, there's been three. And this is the third one. The first one was the Internet. And there was a ton of people in 1994, 95, who said, this is a fad. Nobody's really going to use this thing. Nobody's going to buy anything on this, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm was that gonna... first computer we had again? It was the, uh, what was it called? The IBM 46 or something? Well, no, I started with way before that. I had a 286, then I had a 386 DX40, then I had a 46 yeah. DX4 100, then Pentium, and it went on from there. But on the on the internet side, you know, everybody said there's no, no way people are going to buy anything there, or interact there. That's not going to be a place for people to collab communicate or whatever else. Obviously, that's pretty wrong. I remember my first email address. I think it was 80 characters long, right? <laughs> so things are a little bit different then. The second one is cloud. Well, yeah, discussion and, boards went back then. I remember you you were you really on entry into the whole, and I didn't understand any of that. I'm like, I, I, I'd just be out on my bike or whatever, and you're hammering yeah, that, away so these discussion So pre-internet, pre I was on bulletin board systems, coding assembly, hacking games like Wing Commander, and so on. So uh, <laughs> that was definitely a lot of fun back then. But uh, then the internet came along. That was, you know, that, that changed a lot. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. But and, I'd say the second, the second big one is is cloud. And, you know, I was in on-prem CRM at the time, so selling software that, you know, you put on your servers that your IT team managed, you know, literally in their offices. And that might seem completely foreign. It's like a home phone. Like, what is that, right? And at that time, Salesforce was really one of the first major adopters of that, and that's how they got to where they are today. And then, you know, when AWS came along and, made it possible for anybody to build cloud apps. It just dramatically changed the velocity, the speed of building products, getting to market, finding customers, all of those things. And people who said, no, 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 companies will never buy on-premise. It's the same thing as saying, no, 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 nobody will ever use a phone without a keyboard. Like this is, this is that moment, but I think this is an even possibly an even bigger moment than those two. Actually, I actually had a weird dream the other night about my BlackBerry with the phone that had the uh, the, the the keypad on it, and yeah, it felt. It, you look at it now, and it just feels so strange that that was the direction because of just the way the interface was done. Yeah, you know, uh, if for anybody who hasn't seen it, I highly, highly recommend the independent film BlackBerry. Um, it was an incredible movie. I think it's. I lived in Kitchener Waterloo at the time when BlackBerry was taking off like a rocket ship, and um, it really, I think, hits home on the innovator's dilemma and really inertia of, you know, 
sticking to what you think your company is and refusing to adapt to the market that's changing. And that's exactly what happened to BlackBerry is they didn't move. They, they, Blueberries were incredible for business people. Like you're, now you have access to your email, a little bit of the internet and things like that when you're traveling. And then there was this whole two-year conversation around speed of typing. Can you type as fast on the iPhone as you can on your BlackBerry? That's all ridiculous because, because the iPhone was significantly more than just a communication device. And with AI today, I think the changes are bigger than any of these things we're talking about right now. So completely changes your business model, et cetera. Well, I think Simon Sinek was a big guy who talked a lot about this. He talked about how, you know, iPhone really isn't a technology company. It's more like branded as a movement. Whereas, you know, companies like IBM and that sort of thing, they sold hardware. And, yeah. you know, people don't buy hardware. They, they buy into the movement. And the, uh, the big deal was for iPhone. And, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a super expert on this, on the hardware side, at least, but it was the app store, you know, and at the time I was a BlackBerry business partner and we're building apps for BlackBerry. They're charging us a pile of money. We have to buy all our devices. Coding for it was incredibly hard. Then iPhone uh, and iOS co comes along and says, 99 bucks. That's it. 99 bucks. You're a developer. Just get in the door. You can throw anything in the store, but we're going to prove it and make sure it meets our standards. And that was, you know, they always say Gillette is um, sell the razor to sell the blades. Those were the blades. Yeah. And it yeah, really absolutely. creates a massive moat that, that BlackBerry completely missed with third-party developers, despite the fact at the time having a very large, I think it was a $400 million fund to try and uh, get companies to build on their platform. But systemically, the company couldn't adapt. The people yeah. in the company, the management in the company was just stuck. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So I wonder how many companies are going to be stuck right now when you look at the idea of this, this whole change in the way that business is being done. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing such a huge shift. And I mean, you're looking at companies where, you know, number one, the shift is the idea again uh, in that, that, but this has been from other companies while well, I hear this, this is a movement to bring people back into the office is number one. And then number two is the move, the movement to bring things, you know, more integrated overseas. And the last thing is, is the movement to really, you know, for the people who are forward thinking, really lean on uh, AI in all aspects of the business. So on the first two, I'm, I'm, I tend to be a fan of working in person. I think there's new realities that, um, you know, you do that when you can, and it really depends on the stage of your company. Like if you're a large company, by definition, not everybody on your team is going to be in the same office because you're distributed across countries, thousands of employees, et cetera. So you have been effectively remote for your entire career. Um, but when you're a startup or you're early stage or you're trying to move really fast, adapt, pivot, et cetera, et cetera, it's much easier if you're all in the same room. Uh, but there are certainly great startups that have figured out a way to communicate and collaborate and ideate remotely. Um, so right now my team's remote, you know, we would again, prefer to be in person, but I think, uh, I think you can make it work. You just have to, you have to, you have to standardize ways to get to know each other, standardize ways to how you communicate really, it requires more discipline on a daily basis on how you, you know, check your progress, check in with each other, still build those relationships, which are incredibly important within your team, et cetera. The, um, but for me, AI is like that, that's sort of separate from AI. For me, AI is um, really fundamentally thinking about your entire business, you know, and, and really wondering not just how can I do some things faster, like write a better sales email or whatever else. Um, it's actually saying, is my company, how's my company going to change with the, if we look at the rate of development in AI over the past year, imagine that's going to happen every year for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, I think yesterday, um, there's general consensus that AGI might be here in the next three years. And in that scenario, what does that mean? So, so for those of us who have no idea when you use acronyms, throw AGI yeah, okay. into the, so it's artificial general intelligence, basically, um, different definitions of that. Uh, I can Google that, but it generally means a uh, computer that can pass the Turing test. Uh, so an AI that can pass the Turing test or can do the work of humans uh, equal or faster. And when we say the Turing test, again, for those who have no, no idea what that means. Uh, it's math, math stuff. I'd have to Google okay. it exactly for you. Okay. Interesting. So what we're saying is, is, is when we look at AI right now, AI, and I think kind of like Westworld almost in this perspective, you're saying they're sort of moving 
further into that sort of like almost real thinking kind of mentality mm -hmm. is what you're saying. Yeah. So when a lot of people think about AI right now, they're just like, again, here's some copy or content that I wrote. Can you just like make it better? Or can you write something for me? Or can you summarize something, et cetera? But there is a foundational reasoning in these LLMs that, that we need to think a lot about. So with my company, for instance, Data Parrot, I'm using the foundational reasoning to interpret unstructured, incomplete CRM data to create analytics automatically. So instead of, you know, if you have a CRM tool like Salesforce or HubSpot or any of these things, most people, if you're a smaller company, you export to Excel and you clean it up and create some reports and things like that. If you're a mid to larger company, you probably have a data warehouse set up and you're constantly fighting data quality issues and yelling at the sales team to enter the data better, things like that. With the foundational reasoning of the LLMs, you can actually connect those dots. You don't need to do that. That could be done for you. So, and then you can also interpret those results. And then if you take that further, AI, for instance, for us at Data Parrot, you can use AI to go and uncover trends in your data that you don't even know are happening. So this so in is other not, words, ask it, yeah. ask it just like what, uh, when you ask ChatGPT or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, what are the questions that I don't know? Or what are the questions I need to ask to get better? That, and it's going to know those. Yeah, what I'm far more excited about is that's that's pull. So everybody thinks about ChatGPT and AI as a prompt. You type something in, you get some sort of answer, mm -hmm. you hope it's good. And how much access it has to your data will influence the result that you get. I think the most exciting part is the autonomy, where there's actually a push. If you don't do anything, imagine if you get a text in the morning that says, yesterday your pipeline went down by 10% because three salespeople closed off four deals. Here's why they closed off the deals. You're now going to miss this quarter's number. Here's some recommendations on what you should do. Yeah, that, I think the most exciting thing that. about the last the, the thing said there is, here's the recommendation of what you should do. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah, and I think for now at least, those decisions are still human, right? I think AI can definitely help guide those decisions, but there's so much nuance to your business, how you're thinking about your company and things like that. And I've, we've got some solutions coming that, that can definitely solve for this, but I still think the human reasoning on the actions piece. There could be recommendations, but the recommendations into actions, I think, is still owned by humans. But it's about shining a light on more data with better summaries in a proactive way so people get it as quickly as possible to accelerate their business. That's amazing. That's amazing. And Data Parrot, so let's talk about that one a little bit, just mm -hmm. just for, for, for some discussion points. So basically, my understanding is Data Parrot will overlay on top of a CRM system. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to go out into that CRM system and based on what the user is doing and based on sort of what a description is around, whether it's finding it or not, I don't know, but around what the avatar of the client is, the best client. And, and it's going to kind of mash that all together and say, the things that you are working on, this is what's going to happen. Is that summarize yeah, Along it? those lines. So um, imagine if you took an MBA with an incredible data analyst who's good at SQL with somebody who's an expert in your business. And you put those three people into one and they're your sidekick as either the founder, the CEO, the chief revenue officer, VP marketing, VP sales, VP customer success. That's what we're building. So, so it's like an automated business analyst. Yes. And proactive because a lot of the times data analysts and teams, they build what they're instructed to build. They don't, go on these sort of long, deep dives into the data to find other underlying trends and patterns. So if you don't have, if the leadership doesn't say, build me this report, that report never gets built and you never know that you should be building that report because something's happening. So then you find, so how that shows up is you end up with some report where a stat doesn't look good, then you drill in, you drill in, you drill in, you drill in, and then you figure this truth out. Imagine if you got that truth a month before, two weeks before, six months before. So I think really when it comes down to it, AI is a massive accelerant. And for us, that's around uh, serving up soup, like in, insights and data. Nice. And where, where are you seeing things going from, from where you're going to take it? Like that's a pretty aggressive starting point. Mm -hmm. How do you improve from there? Like where, what does that look like six months from now? Yeah. So we start with, um, as you mentioned, we start with the CRM tool. So we use HubSpot right now. Salesforce is coming, of course. The, um, but that's not, that's not where we're going. That's one part of the story. When you think about how you build revenue for your company across lead to cash, the whole process, there's all these other things that touch on what you need to do. What, what salespeople should you hire? What are their profiles? What, the should, what, what should they look like? Another one might be um, what adjacent markets should you enter? 
Another one might be, um, what about payment? So for example, you might sign up, like, create some leads, they turn into customers, but they take 180 days to pay, right? Or things like that. So looking at that entire process. So for us, it's connecting to all these different systems. Like for example, one of the agents that we're starting to work on now is taking your Notion. So Notion, if you don't know what that is, it's like a confluence or a document management tool. Some people just use a bunch of Google, Google Docs or a bunch of Word Docs or things like that. For us, we're starting with Notion, where we can actually go into Notion, learn about your business, learn about what's important to you, read your 2024 plan if you've written one, and then even say, where are you at against that plan and things like that. And here's some recommendations. Wow. So you're saying it's, it's you're going to you know dive a little bit into the HR side of things, uh, you know, kind of look at the sales results. Now, if you look at that, I mean, I know when we do look at hiring people, uh, we look at disk profiles. Mm -hmm. And would you be, you know, kind of tying into some of the the indexes or that sort of thing? Or are you just looking at what results get spit out based on? For sure. So, at, you know, a, a startup I worked at a few years ago, um, we needed to stand up a, an inside sales team pretty quickly. So SDRs is what we call it in my world. And we didn't know because it was early stages, which profile would make sense. So we hired some that were dial for dollars, you know, making 150 calls a day. We hired some that are a bit more thoughtful, more of an ex account executive profile, and then customer success people who like to take care of customers, but maybe are not great at the, the acceleration of the sales cycle piece. We hired those different profiles to say which one will make the most sense, at least for this target, that, target market that we're applying. And we were surprised it was actually the customer success group that was the most successful. So I think when I look at things like that, um, it's not always super self-evident and you know, we've both been in sales and related to sales to a long time for a long time. And we know one thing, if you ask a salesperson what makes them successful, they will give you the wrong answer, <laughs> right? They will not <laughs> tell you the right answer. They will say something like, because I'm a better salesperson. Well, why? Because customers like me more. You don't get like you, you have to ask 17 whys, not just five whys to get to the truth. And even then you might not, might not find the truth. So looking into their behaviors in the tools that they use, their actions, et cetera, I think is an, is an interesting way to profile um, the appropriate salesperson for your company. Well, and you know, on that side, I think we've seen this many times because we, you know, working beside each other when we were in the CRM industry um, and we were dealing with, you know, thousands of sales reps, you know, around the world. You know, one of the things that, that we found is it doesn't take just one type to win. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're, we were in a business where, you know, I don't know, the aerospace companies we were dealing with or whatever. And you talk to one guy and he'd be like Harvey Specter from Suits. And then you talk mm -hmm. to the other guy and he'd be like, you know, uh, somebody straight out of a lab mm -hmm. and their, their numbers are on parity, but they just both used a very different methodology to succeed. Yeah. And it's, and it's um, definitely within the same role. You can have like the same job, same company of two different profiles succeed, but also, Somebody who is successful, let's say, in the early days of Salesforce, that's not the profile that you would have in Salesforce today. So it also is stage appropriate. You know, do you have mm, processes built out? Do you have all of that stuff? So I think it's also, are they the right puzzle piece for where you're at with your company today? So I think it's very is, important is the yeah. timeliness of it. You're right. Like, I mean, if somebody, somebody who's boots, used to bootstrapping, you know, jumps into a, a you know, multi-billion dollar company. You know, they might run headstrong into so many problems with the uh, just the administration stuff that has to happen around it. And just likewise, if somebody who yeah. comes out of a billion dollar company into, you know, a startup mode, they might not understand that. Let's just get a decision and move forward. Like speed is important. Well, and, and also, yeah, if you've got the, the, the biggest problem that we see over and over is, especially in the startup world. So around C to Series A, depending, that's when the 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 company starts to hire sales, like maybe a VP of sales. You know, the founder has been running sales, they hire VP of sales. What happens over and over and over again in there is they hire somebody who has an incredible LinkedIn profile. You look at their LinkedIn, you're like, oh my God, and they're gonna pay them this huge salary, but they're gonna come in. But that person, let's say they built a startup, maybe they built two or three and they were part of that process, but they've been at Salesforce for the last eight years. They've been at NetSuite for the last eight years, et cetera, et cetera. They really, really have to interview to make sure that are they are they really ready to come back to this stage with a product that isn't going to be overly processed, maybe release notes are inaccurate at times, you know, all of these different things that make it more difficult to sell. Whereas they're following a practiced rhythm in motion, 
in their existing company that just works. And when you come to a younger company, you're going to throw some stuff out the window. And it's actually the ability to react and the ability to take your skill set, but adapt to this company that you're with now and adapt to the realities of you don't have all the, you don't have sales engineers, you don't have product specialists, you don't have product marketing, you don't have all these different roles, which by the way, I think a lot of those roles are going to go away with AI. But You might not even have an admin. <laughs> well, you, you, so between, during the uh, COVID, uh, COVID years, there was a lot of uh, overhiring done by overfunded startups. That's for sure. Yeah. There was an admin for the admin to the admin. Along those yeah. lines, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. When all of those, you know, a good chunk of those, if, if they don't understand AI, they're probably not going to be there. They're in trouble. And what I love about this time right now, you know, of course, this is not as strong as the market and all that stuff. But today, we're all back to building. Like, that's the focus. We're not trying to, even raising money is not, if you're a startup, that's not the North Star. The North Star is building product that customers want. We're back to that. There's no other, there's no noise. We have narrowed the aperture back to where it should be. And, I, and I'm so happy about that because, I mean, obviously being in the, the sales space where, you know, we go into companies and help them figure out how to grow or in the, 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 the businesses that we own, like the mortgage business we have, where we're looking at, you know, people, the cost of money is starting to become tangible. Whereas before the cost of money, it was just so low that, I mean, you could buy any property and it didn't matter. You're going to make money. And when, oh, yeah. when things get to that point that it doesn't matter how stupid, I remember the one time you were, you were talking about the first internet boom and it always will sit in my head where you're talking about pets.com and how much money they got. And, uh, and I, I, mean, I, I think they're obviously not around anymore. Ever buying your puppy online or whatever. Um, the idea that you could just put any shingle out and it's just going to make money that there's a recipe for disaster. there. Well, what, what became the, the most important skill for a founder um, during late 2020 through mid 2022 was narrative building to raise money. So what happened with startups is their customer was not the customers they're selling the product to. Their customer was the VC and they indexed everything they did, their metrics. You know, people would do things like, well, VCs don't like long sales cycles. So let's just not create an opportunity until we're quoting just basically faking the numbers. This stuff happened everywhere, super rampant. And this is, it's, this has always happened in variations of this, but the, the challenge that I have with that is it, it actually turns the culture of the entire company away from creating value for customers and towards raising money as the objective. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and you know, I, when I was at a collision and I'm talking to companies and you're talking about, you know, because again, I, our whole goal is to help people grow, you know, 30% in 90 days if we can, depending on the company mm -hmm. size and where they're at. But, you know, the, you kind of have that conversation with some people and, and they're sort of resonant, reticent at this, you know, startup company to talk about revenue because they know the second they start hitting revenue numbers, accountability starts to fall into play with the VCs. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and now they're sort of locking their value and they're like, no, 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 we don't want revenue. And, uh, we're just going to back away from that. Yeah. You know, and, that, that makes me think about the Figma story, which I, I don't know off the, like, the details in this moment, but generally what happened with Figma, who sold to Adobe recently for a uh, very large exit, Figma took five years to figure it out. Like They took five years to figure out what customers actually wanted to buy before they actually started getting the traction that they wanted and things like that. So um, that five years of figuring that out where I'm sure things were bumpy and sideways and they might have had a fake hockey stick for a minute, then it came down, you know, this types of things happen. That's okay. And I think founders should be okay with that. In my opinion, founders should just, again, obsess forever on creating value for customers. And the other note is that in my world, that's called product market fit. But product market fit isn't something you just achieve and it's checked off. Now you move on because you're going to move into new ideal customer profile types. You might expand, you know, the size of the customer, the geography of the customer, the nature of the customer. You might introduce new products. All of these things change at who your customer is, and therefore, you don't have product market fit at, at that moment. So the whole point is, product market fit is a permanent journey your company should always be on. Always be on. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. I mean, I'm working with a company right now that went through an absolute massive, and they're an older company. They've been around for a long time. And they're in the um, 
uh, uh, PPE space. And could you imagine what their business was like over the past two mm-hmm. years? And, uh, and then now they're moving into a, a, another space where now they're just a, like a company like everybody else. And, and right. how do you keep that rhythm of growth, uh, you know, after going through such a, a, a burst like that? And well, uh, it's also on the other side, it's on the L side of the P&L, right? Which is uh, you got to look at your, your, your costs and your expenses, because a lot of times when companies go through rapid growth, they overstaff. And you've got to think what your new unit economics reality is in that moment. Yeah. And that's, those are hard decisions to make. But, you know, in the end, if you're the founder or CEO, you have a fiduciary responsibility to do the right thing, to keep the company going, keep it growing, make it Absolutely. profitable and deliver value to the shareholders. Well, the greatest thing about this company is they're long thinkers, right? That's and good. so, yeah. so they, didn't, uh, they didn't do anything, uh, you know, that put themselves in jeopardy. Yeah. So it was great to see. Like, yeah, that. I saw a lot of the opposite during... Oh yeah, no, I, absolutely. No, these these really are wild. these are people who think in very long terms. So, <laughs> but well, you know, the good news on the investment side, due diligence is back, which yeah. I actually, as a founder who's you know in the process, eventually of raising money and things like that, I appreciate that because I want my company to go through processes like that to have that rhythm and cadence of, you know, having a board, you know, sharing information with the board, being transparent, being open knowing how to run your business properly, that you can provide those metrics on demand as needed, et cetera, et cetera, versus, you know, <laughs> literally multiple companies during 2020 to 2022, actually their data they provided to their investors in the raise was grossly incorrect because they just didn't know what they're doing. Yeah. Or, or they just wanted to get the, get the raise. Yeah, that, 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 <laughs> the, 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 the secret truth during um, that time was invest, you know, uh, something called a secondary. So when founders raise money, typically this was reserved for later stage, Series B, Series C, et cetera, but it actually moved up definitely to, to A and even C at times. So you might see a company raise, I'll just pick a number, $20 million, Series A. The founding team might sell some of their shares in that transaction cash out one to two million dollars themselves so then the founders would say do i really care about building a long-term viable sustainable company or do i just want to keep raising more money because this is putting cash in my pocket today (laughs) that's right right the idea of a secondary is was originally i I think this is a great idea at series b series c a lot of these companies might be raising 150 million let's say at a 600 million plus valuation billion valuation they might get acquisition offers. If they're getting that type of offer, they might get an acquisition offer for, let's say, 200 million. Really hard to turn that down if you're a founder. So that's why you would do a secondary is you would take the personal finances off the table and put the lens and the focus of building the company to the next stage. I think that's reasonable, but early stage, all the way through series B, I think secondaries are kind of bullshit. Yeah, no, I would think that. I mean, if you're looking at the, the the best for the business, is that what you're kind of focusing on? Best for the business rather than best for the investor? Yeah, because it, it changes the um, what the founders focused on. Yeah, like there were there was founder private groups saying, "Hey guys, don't don't try and build a company to go get customers. Build a company to get the metrics that investors want, so you can cash checks. And then who cares if your company dies?" Yeah, it's crazy. I think it's like it's on the spectrum of fraud, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that I would feel that way too. Yeah, I would feel that way too. Now, just kind of getting back onto, uh, you know, talking a little bit about AI. Have you seen that in the investor space where investors really kind of hit off uh, a little bit on, you know, how they interface in that space using AI? Are they using technology to analyze companies? Are the are companies using uh, AI to source funds? Is there anything happening in in that perspective? There are some some people who are you know working on AI to validate businesses and things like that. I personally, in my interactions with investors, haven't seen um, AI as a key thing, right? Like when they're researching. So what I think investors would do is maybe when they're researching a market, when they're researching competitors, when they're researching value propositions, sizing TAM, all of the total addressable market and things like that. I think they'll use it there, but I don't know if they're using tools yet. And I know there's a, a few companies trying to get in that space. Um, I think in the end, the investor, like you really have to dial it back and say most investment in professional investors, so venture capitalists, most of them, when they raise a fund, 
they raise it from limited partners. Limited partners could be a bank, could be a family office, could be, you know, a state, a province, a country, whatever, right? All these, these mm -hmm. different funds could be universities. So when they raise from those LPs, they usually say, here's the thesis of our fund. So when you give us money, we're going to go and invest it in these areas. And that might change or whatever else, depends on a lot, but typically that's what happens. Mm -hmm. So they have a fund thesis. So what they're really looking to do is to say, is your company in our fund thesis? And they may use AI to validate some of that or think about that, but I think it's still very much um, the, the, part, the, the GPs, the general partners at the fund who, who think through and analyze the business. But I'm sure they're using AI more and more to accelerate that process. And I'm sure the associates in those VC firms are, are using AI extensively. Now, if you think about any of the things that we had talked about and we're looking about some of the directions of, of AI and what, what, you know, small to medium businesses really need to focus on and maybe some topics that we haven't explored, what would you kind of, what would you put to the forefront right now? Anything that, that we haven't hit on? Yeah. So I would say there's three things that I think about. The first one is stay on top of AI changes weekly, like not monthly, not quarterly, not yearly. You're a small business. You can react. You're not submitting a 2024 plan right now. And that's all you're going to do. If things change, you can react to that moment. Larger companies can't do that. So that ability to be nimble, super important. You know, so stay on top of AI. There could be new tools that come out, you know, new technologies that come out that could dramatically increase or help your business. The second one I would say is skill up. I think you should look at your team, look at everybody in the company and say, if I added these skills to these team members, what would that, how would that impact my company? Grow, growth, reducing costs, et cetera, et cetera. So skill up everybody in a way that, you know, whether that's, I personally think everybody should learn Python. That's my own opinion, but I think Python is a great enabler. I don't think you have to become an expert in it, but it opens up so many possibilities today in what you can do. And ChatGPT could even generate the Python for you. If you code some Python, it doesn't work. You literally just copy it, paste it, copy, paste the error into ChatGPT and say, why doesn't this work? It'll tell you why it didn't work. Then you can copy, paste it back. So what would be a use case for somebody learning Python? Why, why would they want to learn it? An example. So here's one example. Um, let's say we're talked about outbound before. So everybody's spamming outbound, right? And their goal is, well, conversion rates are down. So let's just send even more. Well. What happens if you manually do this first? You say, I really want this company as my customer. So I know who the executive team is. It's really easy to find out, you know, the CEO, COO, wh whoever matters for you, the key decision maker. Have they done interviews? Are they, have they been on podcasts? Have they been, are they quoted in YouTube videos? Go get those transcripts, dump that into ChatGPT and say, what matters to this person? What, how do they think? What's important to them? Do they have key business strategies that they're trying to focus on next year, et cetera, et cetera? So you get that stuff out. Then you can construct your outbound or even run a little Google Ads campaign or run a little Facebook Ads campaign that just targets them, like ABM, account based marketing, that just targets them, but laser focused on what they've told the world is most important to them. So then you test that. So that's all manual. But then if you say, okay, wow, this is working, instead of using the ChatGPT interface directly, you could just take names, throw that into Google Sheet, learn Python to scrape websites using Beautiful Soup. You can use the OpenAI API endpoint or Clode or whichever one you like to then go and summarize that information. So now you can scale it up a little bit. So it, it kind of fills this gap between doing something manually and then overbuilding a complicated system because you can hack something together and get it out in a day or two. So it's really the glue that brings all the systems together. I think it just allows you to inter interface with technology to rapidly increase experimentation, for sure experimentation. Because, you know, take integrations. Um, you know, you're going to have to set up EPL tools and, like, use Integrate or Tray or all of these different tools to Zapier connect systems. Or whatever, right? Yeah, Zapier and stuff like that. So I think those tools are great, but maybe there's some stuff you could prototype first before you go and make that big commitment to pick a tool and connect it and all that stuff. Because even Zapier, if you learn Python, you can do probably what you wanted to do yourself and maybe even inject some custom processes in there that, that, stand, that help you stand out. Because keep in mind, everybody else is using Zapier and all these tools. So anything you can do that separates yourself, makes you faster, et cetera, et cetera, is great. 
And what, how I really think about that is a go-to-market arbitrage opportunity. So the arbitrage is you're learning Python in your go-to-market functions, and you're accelerating these things while 90% of the world is still not even use, using ChatGPT. 10% are, but they're just using the front end and like maybe once a month. And you're here like doing it, coding it. You have a huge opportunity to, I think in those moments, like take market share, grow revenue faster, be more efficient, you know, it ultimately for sure grow the bottom line. Yeah, I think it's, I think, I mean, again, I was a company I was talking to yesterday was just talking about the idea of, you know, being able to go out and reach out, you know, if you could scrape the Facebook pages or whatever of all of your clients, uh, you know, and be able to then send a, ma a message like if you know that they really love, say, the hockey game and and then send them out a, a quick little message. Hey, you know, uh, Habs, the Habs won, go team. And, uh, you know, you didn't send it, the AI did um, because you it just it knows that that and the next person is talking about, you know, the, the cricket game or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, I think. So I would say that times 10, because, you know, that's building rapport, which I think is great. But I think mm -hmm. um, what's going to make somebody engage with you if they've never heard about you before is do they have a burn, a hair on fire problem? Yep. And does your company solve that hair on fire problem? So figure out if they do figure out who does. That's intent marketing. It's maybe getting better now. But figure out if they have that hair on fire problem or if they have an adjacent problem, figure out how to expose that this is really a hair on fire problem by how you reach out. Because in the end. When somebody reads your outbound email or sees your ad from a business perspective, they're going to think one of two things. Does this make me more money or does this save me money? Nothing else matters. Well, yeah, I think there's four things that I mean, we talk about. We say, is it going to solve a pain? Is it going to give pleasure? Is it going to give me community or is it going to give me altitude? Right? Is it going to you know, put yeah, me above enough. the rest? I mean, I got to buy yeah, a I'm Rolex. Yeah, I'm thinking purely B2B SaaS lens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that, uh, that is definitely, you know, and a pain is obviously the, the number one thing. Mm -hmm. Pain is the number one. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Uh, Painkiller, not vitamin. That's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> the old age-old saying. <laughs> awesome. Well, so you know, we're getting near the end of the time. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, definitely a true pleasure to to share this time with you, and hopefully, our our, our listeners have really you know gra grab some value. I know for me, every time that you and I talk, I always walk away going, "I am the better looking one." But man, do you know a lot of stuff? And, Look at uh, this. This jaw's starting to get chiseled. There's a little bit more to go. <laughs> Soon I'll get you into the jujitsu world, man. Soon. Uh, we'll Soon. see. We'll see. <laughs> so if people want to get a hold of you, what's the what's the best way to reach out to you? Yeah, you can certainly hit me up at Chris at dataparrot.ai. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm the only Chris Hamoon on LinkedIn. That's H A M O E N. So I'm very, very uh findable. So send me a message on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Or if you use HubSpot and are looking to get some interesting analytics or just give us some feedback on what we're building, you can check out our website at dataparrot.ai. Yeah. I was talking with a, a couple of HubSpot users about what you're doing and they're like, are you kidding me? Like, this is like revolutionary what you're doing. And, and, and I, I've said to you many times, man, I can't wait to bring it, bring it out to some of the other platforms uh, because that just changes the game 100%. Because data is, data is huge. It's everything. And uh, yeah. being able to pull you know, it out and usably yeah. and, uh, you know, with, with a click of a button, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's shocking that in 2023, most data and analytics done by uh, CROs, VPs of sales and so on are still pretty much in Excel manually on a Friday night or on a Thursday night planning for the Friday morning sales meeting. That's, <laughs> that's right. pretty much uh, <laughs> most of the world still functions this way. So um, and I think that's important to replace that piece. But what I think is more important is to find those opportunities to prevent um, to, to prevent deals, prevent your company from losing deals that you otherwise would have lost to jump in there and have the chance of saving it. And then of course, accelerating deal velocity, growing pipeline, understanding leading indicators and so on. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, I mean, we could certainly have a whole nother podcast discussion around is, is what the new world of CRM looks like. And, yeah. uh, because it's, okay. I mean, when you and I first started in that space, you know, it was act and gold mine and contact management. And, and now mm -hmm. it's a whole new world of what CRM is. Mm -hmm. And and how to you know not only create user adoption but use that to create better client experience and uh, and that that could be a whole topic we could get completely on its own. Yeah, totally. There are huge changes coming to CRM. You know, HubSpot is taking off like a rocket in the SMB space. Yeah, their the pace of their feature development and what they're pushing has been incredible. I'm super impressed with with HubSpot. You know, Salesforce still owns the enterprise space, and then of course you've got the other people like Microsoft Dynamics, SAP, and so on. 
there are in there are people circling that space and they're starting to come in closer and closer and closer so we'll see what that looks like but um yeah that that is definitely another totally co full conversation <laughs> right there well awesome i would look forward to seeing you at the event uh, that we're having and uh and speaking on that uh, perspective talking specifically around ai and guys uh, again chris hamoon uh, data parrot uh really excited to have you thanks so much and we'll see you guys on the next event.